and they started looking for appropriate bodies upon which this body of a super teacher can be imposed upon. So people gathered around him, enormous wisdom and sense. So Khalil Gibran said about J. Krishnamurti, when I walk into the room, just those five Saturday afternoons, an hour and a half, that much impact he had on me. Jiddu Krishnamurti was born in a village called Madanapalli. I have been to his house where he was born and where he lived. A century old house, a cute little house, nice place. It's kept like a monument for him today. At one time in early twentieth century and late nineteenth century, Theosophy spread across the world in a big way. This was started by Madame Blavatsky, who had uh, a great interest in occult and mysticism and uh, she spent. Late nineteenth century and early twentieth century saw a lot of British and other European seekers of mysticism, traveling to India and exploring and writing lots of books, many of them, you know. Max Muller, Paul Bronton and many others. Blavatsky was even before them. These are all mm, explorers of mysticism. It was in those days not like going to some place to learn, it was an adventure that you really have to take off on a horseback and go to a strange country, battle all kinds of things, try to meet the right kind of gurus and it was a whole adventure. So they put themselves through all this. Madame Blavatsky traveled to all kinds of places, she went to Tibet, she went to India and uh, then she came down to Tamil Nadu and set up the Theosophical Society out there, which still is there. And uh, then their dream became to produce a perfect being project. Then they unearthed this information. I don't know to what extent uh, they went, but actually in the yogic lore, in the tradition, there was a yogi by the name Sunira. Sunira saw that human consciousness could be evolved if you produce a perfect human being who could render this to all sorts of people. In a way, he comes from the tradition of Shiva, somewhere it's his dream to build another being like that. He wants to build a living Shiva once again, a perfect teacher for the world, who… who is completely multidimensional, not this kind of teaching or that kind of teaching. As Shiva gave, explored the whole human consciousness and human body in every possible way, he wants that kind of a living being. So he started building the energy body for that kind and then he believed that he could build a physical body on top of that and let him loose in the world. With a lifespan of a few hundred or thousand years so that he will transform the whole world by the time his time is done. So he started working on this project. And of course he died unfulfilled. Many ambitious yogis picked up the same project that Sunira had left and tried to reconstruct this energy body of a perfect teacher who can transform human consciousness. So, Madame Blavatsky, Leadbeater and Annie Besant who came together to power this 
theosophy movement across the world, which they successfully did to a large extent and they gathered the most phenomenal occult library on the planet is still in the Theosophical Society of India. They gathered every kind of book on occult and they set up a whole study team. Even now, J. Krishnamurti's groups are called study groups, yes? Study circles or study groups, say because these study groups were set up by Anibas Hent and Leadbeater. These are brilliant intellects, no question about that. But they have no inner experience, but they have gathered phenomenal amount of information. So somewhere they believe with this information and with their intelligence and intellect, they can recreate all this. And they were started looking for appropriate bodies upon which this body of a super teacher can be imposed upon. Jiddu Krishnamurti, Rukmini Arundel, uh, who else? One more, whatever. They started putting them through very severe training to prepare them physically, mentally. But they have no inner experience. They're reading books and trying to do this to these boys and they put J.K. in all kinds of meditative processes and he attained to a certain level of… he became a fantastic human being. He was something that nobody could decipher, but he was like a flower, his fragrance could not be missed. Then they decided when J.K. was about twenty-seven, twenty years of age, twenty-seven or twenty-eight years of age, this theosophical society decided to announce to the world that he is the world teacher. The perfect teacher has come. People gathered with great interest in this. J.K. came on the podium and he said, I am not a world teacher. Poof! The whole Theosophical Society and their project, everything went down the tube. He had the courage and the sense and the wisdom to say, I am not. Most idiots would have said, yes, I am the world teacher, I am the reincarnation of Buddha and Jesus and everything. Most idiots would have done that. He had the sense and the wisdom and the vision to say that I am not this nonsense that they are trying to make me out of. And J.K. came out of theosophy and he started speaking. He's a brilliant speaker. So people gathered around him, enormous wisdom and sense. So when he spoke, people sat wrapped. Quite magical the way he speaks. You know, somebody was talking to me, when I was just seventeen, eighteen years of age, someone was talking to me, JK study circles, it was fashionable. For all those people who think they're intellectual, you have to read JK, you have to listen to JK's audios, otherwise you're not intellectual enough. In… in the Indian intelligentsia, if you have not read J.K., Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky, you have no brain actually. That's how it's treated. So it's like fashion. For everybody, they should have read this, whether they get it or they don't get it. You read Dostoevsky, you read Kierkegaard, you read J. Krishnamurti means you got some brain working. That's a gauge. So, people were talking, J.K., J.K., he's uh, something every Saturday afternoon, some… they have a study circle where they play some audio tapes and uh, his books are there and things. Some of my friends invited me and I went. So, they were playing a short video. The man was sitting like this, this is the first time I'm seeing him, the first time I'm listening to him. He was still alive at that time. Just the integrity of the person is… is spilling all over him. Just the sheer integrity of the man cannot be missed. So, I didn't do much reading, I heard a few audios and watched a few videos. I enjoyed him but uh, I was uh, too wild to listen to anybody. I had no time for anything. Life was calling me all the time. So I had no time to listen to my parents or my teachers or JK or IJ or XYZ, you know. <laughs> 
I had no time for anything, so I left the study circle and went on. Maybe I attended this for about five weeks, I remember very well. It was about five weekends I went there, every Saturday afternoon, just for about an hour and a half. They would play one half an hour video or audio, and then they'll all get into discussion and one big confusion. <laughs> because nobody around him understood what he's talking about. Because he refuses to use any method, he refuses to use any example, he refuses to use any parable, any story, any joke or anything. Just… this is just intellectual dissection. This is called as Gnana Marga. This is pure Gnana Marga. Gnana means the way of the intellect. Out of these seven billion people, if you find ten thousand people who have that kind of a razor-sharp intellect, who can without any kind of context, they can go on slicing things. You will not even find ten… I don't think you'll find ten thousand. Maybe you'll find a thousand people. And those thousand people may not be interested in the spiritual process. They may be trying to slice through the stock market, they may be trying to slice through something else. <laughs> so, around JK, everybody could feel the man is special but nobody could get what he was talking about because he refused to play the role of a guru, he refused to initiate anybody into anything, he refused to give any kind of method, any kind of process, he said it anyway happen. It is true, anyway it will happen. But maybe after a million lifetimes. So if you are in a hurry, either you must have that kind of an intellect, which is rare. Or you must be willing to use the other faculties that you have of body, energy, emotion, all these things. He went driving on one wheel of his car. He is good at it, but nobody else could get to do it. Fantastic human being. When he was there, there was a fragrance. When he's gone, only books, because there's no living process. So Khalil Gibran said about J. Krishnamurti, when I walked into the room, J.K. was sitting and Khalil Gibran went to meet him. He said, when I walked into the room, I walked into a wall of love. It just hit me in the face. See, you would never associate J.K. with love. He's not a loving man. That's not how he looks. He's like this. He definitely doesn't look loving, but he's very loving. His energies are absolutely compassionate, but his words are like knife. So, uh, people felt something, but they couldn't figure what it is. They couldn't get a hold on it because he wouldn't give a hold. He said, if you hold it, you may get stuck with this, so don't hold. If uh, there were millions of razor-sharp minds in the world, that would have been a fabulous way to do things. But in today's world, in the existing way the humanity is, the way people's intellects are entangled in a million things, that method is just not going to get anybody anywhere. It's a beautiful process, but there must be people who can digest it, isn't it? So, J. Krishnamurti was like a flower. His fragrance was felt when he was alive, and that's all. His words are good if you want to kind of use it as an intellectual exercise to drop a few things, they could be useful, brilliant. His intellectual brilliance just comes out every moment of his life. He started a few schools which are wonderful schools, they're still on. I must tell you my association with him. When I went to this uh, you know, this uh, weekends for five 
five Saturdays, Saturday afternoons, an hour and a half, that's my exposure to him. On one day he spoke about education and uh, it really gripped me. And you know, it, it really twisted me inside out because all the ideas, I had never thought of an alternative way of educating people. I was only thinking of how to dismantle all the education system in my mind. <laughs> when he spoke about education, suddenly it struck me, there was another way to do this. So just this thought came to my mind. I was… I was just maybe a seventeen, eighteen and I was living wild and I have dreams of running away somewhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, I just thought if at any time if a child comes under my control, I would like to put the child to this kind of education. So, it just so happened <laughs> when uh, my daughter had to go to school, when she got admission in some of the best schools in Uti, but then it just flashed me in my mind that, okay, there's a JK school, why don't I send her there? And she went to that school and she spent eight years studying there. So just those five Saturday afternoons, an hour and a half, that much impact he had on me. That I handed over my daughter to his care in one way or the other.